Good morning. Welcome to Lion Air Museum's commemoration of the 75th anniversary of D-Day. I'm Marcus Gropel, and right behind me, they're just about to start the symposium with David Malmed and Walt Drake. So let's go head on down. Thank you. Okay, so the program we have today here, um, I'd like to just give everybody a little rundown so they know how it all works, but uh, we're going to be doing the, the presentation here. It's going to be, we don't know how long, but maybe an hour to an hour and a half, somewhere in that range. Um, we have food outside with the, the hot dogs and refreshments outside. We have both the DC-3, which we refer to as the DC-3, you're going to learn a lot about why I just said that, instead of C-47, DC-3, open and also the C-47 open for, um, for cockpit tours throughout the day. So please uh, make sure you do that as well. So David will be uh, doing the presentation today. So how about a warm round of applause for David Melman. Thank you. So Mark will get paid off uh, shortly. Although the term D-Day is used routinely as military reference for a day a military plan or operation will take place, for many it's only synonymous with June 6, 1944, the day the Allies crossed the English Channel and landed on the beaches of Normandy, France, beginning the liberation of Europe. This ultimately led to the ending of Nazi control during World War II. On that day, the largest amphibious invasion in history took place. The landing was called Operation Neptune, supporting the overall plan Operation Overlord. Two days ago, on June 6, 2019, the 75th anniversary of the date in history, the beaches and skies over Normandy were revisited to commemorate that historic event. A recreation of the airborne assault was demonstrated in daylight hours with perhaps the largest collection of C-47 aircraft at one time since that day in 1944. Only this time, the reception from forces on the ground was far more positive and inviting. When we talk about 1944 and D-Day operations, one of the first thought to most individuals who read the history of that day is that the German forces knew and expected at some point in the future after the war began that an attempt would be made to recover and retrieve the freedoms that were lost by the residents of Europe. What Germany did not know is where the invasion would occur and when. The expectation is that the most logical place for crossing the English Channel from England was the coast around the Pas de Calais. If you've watched movies on the, organ, on the events of that day, you'll be familiar with the reference to Calais and to every attempt to land in those beach areas. The needs of the Allied forces led by Britain and the United States was to convince Germany that Calais was the place, in spite of the fact we know different. Every effort was made in order to convince the German forces we were going there. Calais is only 21 miles from the English coast. From a positive standpoint, it absolutely offers the best opportunity to recover and reclaim the land of Europe. It had a working harbor, it had low lands. What it did not have was open spaces because it was surrounded by both rivers and canals. What it also had, much to the dis dismay of Allied forces, was the German buildup with the expectation that Calais was going to be the invasion point. Both President Roosevelt and Prime Minister Winston Churchill knew that the recovery and the re reclamation of Europe was needed, 
the expectation was to do something in 1942. Britain felt that that would be premature because troops were not trained, equipment was not ready, and in fact it would have been far too early. The efforts that took place on the beaches of Dieppe in August of 1942 proved that true because the Dieppe landing in fact turned out to be less than desirable. The plan was to move forward with a planned invasion to take place sometime in late 43 or 44. Ultimately, the decision was settled on the spring of 1944. A conference held in August of 1943 selected the date of May, late May 1944, which was subsequently changed. Part of the operation depended upon who was to be selected as the leader of the event. General Dwight David Eisenhower, 35-year military life experience, was selected as a Supreme Allied Commander. What was interesting about that selection is Eisenhower, for all his experience in the military, never served one day in combat. All of his experience was operational, behind the scenes, planning the North African campaign, Operation Torch, and other operations prior to World War II. Yet he was considered to be the best strategic planner and easily the best selection for the events. While there were others that could be equally qualified who had the combat experience, it was felt that Eisenhower was the best not only from a military standpoint, but also from a political standpoint. In December 1943, he was selected. One of the first considerations he gave for the events that were soon to occur was not only where it was going to occur, but how. The planning had to be consistent with not only the conditions that appeared along the beaches, but for the weather conditions that had to be positive for the invasion to take place. The general's thoughts were, we need to go in at low tide with a full moon and no weather affecting us. The reason for low tide, they knew full well that the enemy buildup along the beaches would in fact contain a series of obstacles, both hidden and what readily apparent to landing forces. The reason for the full moon was to ensure that the Jumper, jumpers going in at night would be able to see their ground targets. And the reason for the clear weather is both the aircraft in the skies as well as the ship's landing wanted to have as smooth a delivery as possible considering that their welcoming committee were not going to make it smooth. The date was originally agreed on June 3rd. Unfortunately, the weather did not necessarily cooperate as we approached that date. Thought had to be given to what would occur if we changed the date. There were only five days in June where the beach condition, the tide condition, and the full moon existed between the 5th and the 7th. The next opportunity would be on June 19th. But June 19th did not have a full moon, which would eliminate the need for a clear landing for the paratroops as well as any airborne attacks. The next thought had to be given to who were they going to be fighting, not only in terms of enemy forces, but who was going to be leading the defense of those beaches. Marshal Erwin Rommel had been selected back in 1943 to be responsible for the construction of the beach defenses. Rommel, knowing full well that the assault on the beaches were critical for defense, also knew that if German forces could not stop the invasion on the beaches, the war was lost. Up until that time, up until 1944, Germany held the skies between airborne attacks against military installations, manufacturing facilities, and civilian uh, 
populations between 1942 up until June of that year in 1944, the Air Force, the Luftwaffe, was being thinned out. The ability to defend the beaches had to be stopped on the ground. Rommel's responsibility was to build defenses from Norway in the north to the beaches as far south as Spain. The information that he had was, we expect Calais, but we anticipate Normandy. In fact, the only way for Rommel to be able to ensure that it was protected was to have a free hand in building the defenses. Rommel's defense buildup, and we're talking about guns on the beaches, the various obstacles in the water and along the beaches, was only about 18% complete by the time of the invasion. It was expected that of the 2,400 miles of construction he had to effect, 4 million mi landmines had been planted from Spanish coast up to Norway. The plan was to anticipate where it was going to occur in order to ensure that the defense was going to be there at the time. The other expectation was Rommel needed to know that he had the ability to call up armor and personnel when the attack began. Unfortunately for him, the German leadership felt that the only individual that could give permission and authority to move up the defense forces was Hitler himself. And on that particular day and time, when the landing began and when the airborne began landing on the grounds behind the beaches, Hitler was sound asleep and no general in the German army was going to wake him up to tell him. One of the questions comes up with regards to the defense of that area is how did we hide from Germany where we were coming in? If you notice, I have a question asked up here about Operation Bodyguard. Question is asked, where is the invasion coming from? Each one of those arrows points out a location from Norway down to Spain and along the southern French coast as far east as the Balkans, possible points of entry. Should Allied forces enter through southern France or the Balkans? Should they come through Norway and down through northern Europe? Should they come from the French coast? Each one of those locations were considered viable opportunities. We had to convince Germany we were coming in everywhere but Normandy. One of the individuals that was selected to assist in convincing Germany of that was a gentleman whose reputation had already been earned as one of the greatest generals in the U.S. Army, according to German cases. That was General George S. Patton, third armor commander. However, he was not on the first list of selection by either Bradley, who was his deputy, later to be his senior, or Eisenhower. However, Patton did participate in the Normandy invasion, although indirectly. He participated because he was been in charge of a group called FUSAG, the first U.S. Army group. This group operated out of a location that was directly across the channel from Calais. His responsibility was to ensure that Germany would in fact focus on his buildup, on his army. The fact is it was a phantom army. Those photos that you see there represent the army that he was leading. Rubber tanks, rubber planes, rubber boats. Not one of them were going to be flying, driving, or flying. But they in fact were the distinct change between what Germany would envision and what Germany would actually experience. In addition to the fact that you had this phantom army building up, 
the general had to ensure that all radio traffic coming out of his group was in the clear. In fact, he was hopeful that all German radio monitoring Allied traffic was listening to radio messages about troop movements and readiness for the crossing. The hope was that as long as they were paying attention to Patton, they were not paying attention to Eisenhower. In addition to Patton's effort in the buildup, other efforts were carried out. On the day of the invasion, airborne operations were flying over the areas around Calais and dropping chaff. In this case, what they were were pieces of aluminum to be launched out from transports and other aircraft in order to convince the German radar stations monitoring that beach area that an airborne invasion was coming. While the operation was taking place down in Normandy, you had your radar screen filled with hundreds if not thousands of markers suggesting that the invasion was coming to Calais. Further evidence that we really weren't sure where they were coming from, so we needed to be in both places. One of the things that had to be protected, in fact, securely protected, was the secrecy surrounding the invasion and the plans leading up to June 6th. The various beaches that were named during the invasion were well known to the planners. Omaha, Utah, Sword, Juneau, Gold. These were the beaches that Allied forces, primarily US, British, and Canadian forces would be landing on. The names of those operators were clearly known to the invasion force and to the planners. Other names such as Mulberry, Dover had to be known. They should have been known only to those planners and not to the general public. However, in May of 1944, a crossword puzzle appeared in an English newspaper. And what were the words that appeared in that puzzle? Juno, Omaha, Utah, Gold, Mulberry, Dover. Needless to say, security breach was in fact a question. How did these names end up in this crossword puzzle when only a month later you were planning an invasion using some of those same code words. An investigation was carried out. All of the evidence suggested somebody knew and somebody spoke, but no evidence could be found to reveal how it so happened these same exact words ended up. Nobody came forward and nobody was discovered, so they simply wrote it off as coincidence. In 1984, on the 40th anniversary of the D-Day invasion, a 54-year-old gentleman came forward during the review in England and revealed that as a 14-year-old student at a school in southern England, he overheard conversations among some officers. And since he was, in fact, one of the students helping in writing the crossword puzzle, he thought it might be clever to insert some of these words into the puzzle. Clever, yes. Timely, no. Nevertheless, his secret was kept for 40 years until he revealed it himself. Three days before the June 6 date, an individual operating a teletype service in London was putting together a training program to ensure that their speed of writing a message could be communicated quickly. And on June 3rd, the message said, the invasion has begun. French, Free French, British, Canadian, and American troops are now crossing the channel to the beaches of Normandy. That broadcast was sent out to the US and then distributed to some 500 radio stations. 
three minutes later when the discovery was realized that this was a practice message, you now had members of the teletype service scrambling to send out a recall saying, we're only kidding. It's only a practice. Nothing is happening. Once again, did the message get out across the channel? Does Germany know there's an invasion coming? Do they know where? Apparently, they were not listening because nothing changed. A third event, also in June, at an office in London, 12 copies of the invasion plan suddenly disappeared from an office overlooking downtown London. The door was open, the window was open, and the air came in and blew these 12 copies down onto the city streets. Needless to say, members of the office went scrambling for those 12 copies, recovering 11 of them with the 12th one missing. Where did it go? Who did it go to? Fortunately, the individual who found the 12th copy, realizing what it was, surrendered it to a guard at one of the camps nearby. We don't know who that individual was, but we do know the 12th copy was recovered. And in spite of all the security and in spite of those three events and how many others occurred, the secret was still kept. Allied air support beginning for that eventful day needed to practice. And the practice was carried out on an area known as Slapton Sands in southern England. This occurred in April of 1944. Beginning in December of 1943, planning operations were carried out to ensure that the troops hitting the beaches would know how to get off their landing craft, how to assault the beach, how to be prepared for both Allied support as well as enemy fire. Slapton Sands had a beach that was designed similar to the Normandy beaches. A plan was carried out on April 26th and April 27th to send a armada, though smaller in size, to assault the beach to determine what planning had to be focused on and what trips had to be considered. Up to 30,000 army personnel carried in upwards of nine different ships were planned to assault the beaches. Unfortunately, the coordination be both between both naval and army forces had army forces landing on the beach at the same time naval artillery was being launched to the beach. The early landing of the beach assault led to the deaths of 425 army personnel by friendly fire. On the morning of April 28th, nine LSTs, landing ship tanks, these are relatively large ships prepared to carry personnel onto the beaches along with equipment, were circling out in the bay preparing for the morning launch. Unbeknownst to them, radio traffic that was being broadcast by both Army and Navy personnel was being monitored by German radio traffic from Cherbourg Harbor across the English Channel. Recognizing that there was an assault taking place along the beach of England, German dispatched Schnell boats, which are equivalent to the PT boat. These are fast, mobile naval support aircraft, naval support craft. They crossed the English Channel and at 2 a.m. in the morning attacked these nine LSTs resulting in the loss of two sinkings and one damage and, uh, in, and personnel on board injured. In addition to the 425 Army personnel who had been killed the day before, an additional 700 plus personnel were drowned or died from the attacks by the German attack boats. What came out of this training exercise that was not successful? One radio communication between Army and Navy personnel had to be on the same frequencies. Two, 
We know the Germans were monitoring radio traffic. We had to secure the radio communication and signal strength to ensure that they were not being picked up. Three, among the individuals that drowned as a result of the attack, they did not drown from enemy fire. They drowned because the life jackets that they were wearing were incorrectly put on. The English life jackets were a life looking like a life belt. They were to be erected around the body, under the armpit, and then inflated. The typical life jacket that American personnel carry, what they were familiarized with or referred to as the Mae West, was a jacket that fit the body from the shoulders to the waist. Army personnel could not use the English life vest, life jacket, because of all the equipment they were wearing. They could not get it around their shoulders, so they put it around their waist. By inflating it, the body would roll over and be unable to actually sit upright, thereby drowning while they were wearing a life jacket. They discovered that by not wearing it correctly, you increase the risk of individuals not recovering. So while there were losses, there were things gained from the mission. However, one of the things we had to be insured about is what were we going to do before the assault occurred? A final decision set June 4th as a last minute change date because of the unfavorable weather. One of the reasons the meteorologists selected the June 4th date, weather coming across the English Channel from the middle of the Atlantic had cloudy weather, overcast skies, rain, and high winds. The waters of the English Channel would not be su suitable for as many landing craft that were going to be crossing from England. The skies over the coast of Normandy would not be suitable to be able to see the landing points because of the cloud cover. The rain covering the beaches and the waters would not be suitable for the aircraft or the troop members to see the enemy emplacements. June 4th was pushed out. The decision had to be made. What day do we go? We only have three days to choose from. A last minute decision was made. A last minute decision was carried out by Eisenhower. The decision was made June 6th is when we will go. In talking about Allied support for the day before that invasion, we have with us today Walter Drake. Walter was occupying the cockpit of a fighter a P-38 Lightning on the morning of June 5th. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Walter to give you a little bit of an idea of what it was like on that day. Well, that was June, on June the uh, 3rd, 4th, and 5th, uh, my squadron, we were flying P-38s, which is a twin-tail, twin-engine uh, plane, which is easily recognized by most people in, in the UK. And so uh, we figured the P-38 wouldn't draw friendly fire when we were patrolling that beachhead. And so my job that day was a, uh, just patrolling that beachhead and strafing the beachhead prior to our landing, Omaha, Utah, and soared beachheads. And I, that, as I remember that day, I looked in my log book here recently, and actually we flew, our, my squadron flew three missions that day. We didn't carry drop tanks, we carried uh, bombs, and so our range was limited without the, those drop tanks. And so the English Channel is just 22 miles across from England, so that's, it's, it's a fairly short distance. And so our job that day well, for the four, maybe the th first three or four days, we're just patrolling that beachhead uh, to keep the German sky. And uh, didn't see one German during the invasion for, uh, aircraft, because there were so many of us. And we almost patrolled the, the beachhead around the clock. So uh, we were on double daylight savings time in Europe, so at 11 o'clock at night, it was still some light. 
and so we could patrol up until 10:30, 11 o'clock at night. And uh, so anyway, that was what my job was during D-Day in uh, during World War II. Thank you, Walter. You know, part of the planning that went into deciding that Normandy was going to be the selected beach also involved how to figure out with the volume of traffic we know coming in, with the volume of traffic we know coming in, we had to plan how would we get the landing craft as well as the supply ships the vehicles onto the beaches. We had to ensure that along with the close air support provided by the fighters, there would be bombers flying missions covering not only the beach emplacements where enemy buildup was, but also further back to neutralize any enemy aircraft as well as ground support forces coming up. Bridge and bridges, roads, airfields, both in France, Belgium, and into Germany were being attacked in order to minimize and neutralize the defenses on the beaches. And as Walter pointed out, he did not run across any enemy aircraft at the time of his patrol. One of the references made, I spoke of a moment ago, when I mentioned Mulberry. Mulberry was, in fact, portable barge that were created in England, floated across the English Channel to build the docks and the landing areas for the larger ships. Since the ships would not be able to get in close enough to shore because of the tide, they had to be able to be in deep water to be able to offload. The mulberries were these portable caissons. If you were to go to Normandy today, you would see examples left of what the mulberry looked like. For want of a better term, it's a floating dock, only it's a floating dock made out of cement that was launched in order to ensure that they would remain. Storms over the years, however, have in fact destroyed most of the mulberries that are there. To give you an idea of the numbers, I am not going to read these off. I hope they're large enough for you to see. But these are the numbers that existed that day, which is why D-Day is referred to as the largest amphibious landing in history. It has not been exceeded since that day and time. It also is the largest gathering of aircraft at any one point for a military operation. Most of the personnel who were landed on the beaches were land, brought in by landing craft. The merchant vessels, the destroyers, cruisers, battleships were there for off-beach support. The landing craft, the ancillary craft, merchant vessels brought the personnel to the beaches. Some of these landing craft never made it to the beach. Personnel who were in the landing craft never made it off the landing craft. We will go into the casualties in a moment. But to let it be known, if you're familiar with the movie Saving Private Ryan, the first 25 minutes will give you an indication of what it was like on the morning of June 6th. But leading up to June 6th, the evening before is when the airborne assaulted not only the beaches but land behind the beach to cut off any enemy activity moving up. Naval bombardment was supposed to begin at 5.45 in the morning. 6.30 the first landing craft was supposed to assault the beach. It was only about 40 minutes of activity from cruisers, battleships, destroyers, shelling the beaches. Unfortunately, the weather conditions, as much as it cleared, was still not clear day. There was still cloud cover over the beaches, and that many of the shell firing from the 
naval ships did not hit the beach defenses, but in fact fell behind it. As a result, some of the guns that were there were still active when the beach assault occurred. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the Allied Expeditionary Force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hopes and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you. In company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on other fronts, you will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940-41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats in open battle, man to man. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together to victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us all beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. For those of you that might recognize the voice, that was General Dwight David Eisenhower. If you were on the beaches of Normandy or preparing for an assault, you received that both written and in audio the day before. For the vast majority of those who, in fact, went into harm's way on that day, those were the only words they heard prior to the assault taking place. The general, in fact, walked through the troops days before the event, personally thanking them for what they were about to undertake. Know that many of the individuals who were going to be part of the invasion force that day were going into combat for the very first time. 18, 19, 20-year-olds went through training, went through practice. Friendly fire was launched at them. Practice landings took place. But no matter how much training you go through, it does not prepare you 100% for what they experienced that day. Enemy forces, not only in the air but also on the water, were not as heavy as they would have liked. But they were light enough for US and allied forces to, in fact, prefer this. And instead of being assaulted by major aircraft and major shipping, as you can see, the majority of the enemy forces that attacked allied ships were, in fact, limited to torpedo boats, patrol boats, and a variety of German U-boats. Fortunately, most of these were neutralized, although they were successful in attacking and sinking some vessels. Enemy air operations. Not nearly as heavy as Allied forces. Nevertheless, it was still a problem, both for the forces landing on the beaches as well as units behind the beaches. Once again, thanks to people like Walter, we were able to neutralize it. Can you share a little bit more? Can you share a little bit more about your time after the fifth later on in the sixth? Hear, hear me okay? Well, after June the fifth, why we patrolled those beachheads and uh, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh, and just to keep the Germans out of the sky from strafing our troops that were landing. And the, the beach, the landing on June the 6th was, turned out to be very successful. And that was our start off to our march to Berlin. And then from that day forward, why, uh, my, my 
participation in the war was basically escorting the heavy bombers as fighter escort to all the major cities in, in Germany. And we were called a strategic air force at the time, the 8th Air Force. The 9th Air Force was a, was its tactical air force, and they supported the ground troops. Uh, our job mainly was to escort the bombers to, uh, into Germany, bombing their major factories and troop tr concentrations and that type of thing. And so I was in Europe about one year, and once you completed 70 missions uh, over the in the uh, fighter, fighter planes while you were eligible to come home. And so I came home after my tour was up and then they made me a flight instructor for pilots going to the uh, Japanese area, Southwest Pacific. Thank you, Walter. You know, one of the things that uh, a lot of individuals see these uh, museum pieces and will ask, what are the black and white stripes on the aircraft? These are called invasion stripes they were purposely fixed to the planes to ensure that when the aircraft were flying over friendly forces on the ground, they were not fired upon. Shortly after the D-Day invasion took place, many of the aircraft had the invasion stripes removed. One, to ensure that in subsequent missions, not only for the continuation of the D-Day operation, but other operations to the end of the war, that they would not stand out in the air opening up an opportunity for enemy fire against them. Additionally, to see an aircraft on the ground with invasion stripes marked them and made them an easy target when enemy aircraft were coming in attacking bases. So once D-Day was completed, many of the aircraft had the stripes removed. I do want to point out, if you notice the stripes are very nicely pinstriped on and very straight lines, that was not the case on June 3rd which is when the order was given to pinstripe them, no. You got a bucket, you got a mop, you got a job. Put them on. You had six stripes affixed to the bombers and to the fighters. At the end of the mission, they came off the same way. You got a mop, you got a bucket, take them off. give you an idea of some of the numbers in addition to the fact that you had close to 160,000 troops landing you had 12,000 virtually 12,000 aircraft that participated in the total operation this included all types of aircraft this gives you a breakdown I want to pay particular attention to the line third up from the bottom where it refers to 42-100 931. This is the aircraft tail number of a C-47 transport. The C-47 was the aircraft that was used to carry paratroopers into battle. That number belongs to this plane. The aircraft here that is painted in American airline colors in fact served over the Normandy beaches in 1944. It carried troops in in the second wave, members of the 101st Airborne, 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 3rd Battalion. As a reminder, if you were viewers of the program some years ago called Band of Brothers, Band of Brothers was a program that was talking about the 101st Airborne, the 506th Parachute Regiment, 2nd Battalion. Our aircraft carried members of the 3rd Battalion who served on the same beaches in the same battles throughout the war. And in fact, if you were to re-watch the film and re-watch the series and listen carefully to the dialogue, you will hear reference to their unit hooking up with the 3rd. They were talking about troops that came out of our aircraft. This is a D-Day veteran. It served. It served not only on the beaches over Normandy, it served through the war, Operation Market Garden, Battle of the Bulge, Operation Varsity. It came back to the States in September of 1945, and then for the next 70 years served as a commercial aircraft with a number of carriers 
both here in the United States and in Canada, and came to our museum in 2008. But this is the veteran. This is the aircraft that made a difference for many of the personnel who jumped that day. Now Walter spoke about the aircraft that he flew, but in addition to the P-38, there were a variety of other fighters that flew over the beaches of Normandy between the 6th, 7th, and 8th. P-47 Thunderbolt, British Spitfire, the British Tempest Typhoon, P-51 Mustang, the Hawker Hurricane British, the British Tempest, the P-38 you know, the de Havilland Mosquito, a twin-engine British fighter, P-61 Black Widow, lesser known but nevertheless a night fighter, very useful through the war. Each one of those aircraft served a purpose throughout the, the Normandy events, and each one of those aircraft went on for additional service for the balance of the war. But in addition to the fact that there were Allied forces fighting in, on the ground from the sea, fighters and bombers, you still had to deal with the enemy. The enemy did not put up the same volume, but they still were just as valiant. Between July 6th and 7th, between June 6th and the uh, beginning of July, a little over a thousand enemy aircraft made it to the air, to the beaches. FW-190 and the BF-109 were very famous fighters and used throughout the war. The Heinkel 177 came late in the war. The ME-110 twin-engine fighter bomber and the GU-87, the Stuka dive bomber. Each one of these aircraft saw service over the beaches of Normandy. Allied bombers, in addition to fighter support, to attack the bases, the beaches, the defenses that Germany put up, bombers that we had at that time that were used, the A-20 Havoc, the B-17, a model of which is sitting behind you, the B-24 Liberator, the B-25 Mitchell right next to you here, the B-26 Marauder, British, Lancaster, Transports and gliders were of critical use during the service. The transports, like the C-47 behind me, were used to carry the paratroops into battle the night before and throughout the day. The C-47 was towing the gliders known as a CG-4, used for bringing in troops later in the day and for bringing in equipment. The British Horsa glider was used for bringing in equipment glider called a Hamilcar was transporting tanks by air. And the L-4 was used as a observation aircraft to fly over the beaches to check for any buildup and any resistance. I might point out both the C-47, the gliders, and the L-4 in this photo are all unarmed. They might have been carrying armed troops, but the aircraft themselves did not have any offensive or defensive weapons. The units that served on that day, with particular reference to the unit that flew the aircraft and that carried the troops, 9th Air Force was the primary organization that our aircraft flew under. The 440th Troop Carrier Group, our pilots flew from this group flew our plane. The 50th they belong to. The 440th troop carrier, 
and the 97th Troop Carrier Squadron, those were the members of, that were our crew, our pilot. The base that our plane flew out of was called Exeter Field in southeast England. These are photos of what that base looked like at that time back in 1944. The 101st Airborne, 506th, a little bit of history of who they were, how they came into existence, and what happened to them. For members of the 101st to jump into harm's way on the morning of June 6th, their aircraft launched from Exeter Field at 10.30 on the night before. Their jump was at 1.40 a.m. For them to find the location where they were to be jumping, flights went out prior to them, roughly 30 minutes to an hour, carrying a unit known as Pathfinders. It was the Pathfinders' responsibility to set up radio beacons to be used in order to assist the aircraft with the paratroopers to find their respective fields on the ground, known as drop zones. Each one of those drop zones were to be marked by the Pathfinder. Unfortunately, because of the weather condition, many of the aircraft carrying the Pathfinders ended up either overflying the field that they were to drop in on, or when they did drop, they dropped a distance from their location. Some of them ended up dropping into fields that were already manned and set up by the enemy, so it made it very difficult to set up these beacons in time for the incoming flights. Additionally, some of the aircraft with the Pathfinders on board were lost in flight, either through mid-air collisions, ground fire from anti-aircraft batteries, or eventual machine gun fire once they approached the drop zone. However, in spite of the fact that many of the locations were not hit on the spot, the operation still was considered a success. One, because the enemy were unable to defend the beaches sufficiently. Secondly, in spite of the fact that we had an assault taking place the morning of June 6th, because we were still bombing the areas around Calais and we were still attacking the beaches south of Calais, Germany was still not convinced that Normandy was in fact the target and Calais was the diversion. And it wasn't until late in the day, by one o'clock in the afternoon, that the orders were given to bring up reserve forces and to bring up reinforcements to help defend the beaches. By that time, three of the five beaches had been secured. It was only Utah and Omaha where the heaviest defenses were already carried out. But the British and Canadian forces on Juno, Sword, and Gold were able to secure the beaches successfully before resistance increased. Members of the 101st Airborne, known as the Screaming Eagles, were the passengers on board our plane. The 506th 3rd Battalion, as I mentioned, this was their patch. But in addition to the groups of the 506th, this aircraft also carried members of the 325th Airborne Engineers. These were in individuals responsible for carrying the explosives, for neutralizing pillboxes, for taking out bridges, railroad areas, any other reinforced areas. This is the path. Unfortunately, I don't have a pointer, but if you look to the left side, this was the inbound path that the aircraft would take crossing the English Channel to the French coast. The job was to fly in, 
roughly at about 1,500 feet, they would take off. Their first turn, they would be at 1,000 feet. They would drop down to 500 feet crossing the channel, and the plan was to drop paratroopers between 500 to 900 feet over the target. However, because of the cloud cover, the aircraft that were supposed to be flying in were flying in in close formation. The cloud cover, in fact, resulted in their being dispersed. And instead of a tight formation reaching their target area, they were spread out, and many of the troops were, in fact, dropped off target. I don't know if you can see this image, but our aircraft participated as a group of 45 planes. There were aircraft in formations of three in rows of nine. So if you can imagine, each row here represents nine aircraft, and there would have been six rows flying in close formation. Those six rows would be going to a single target. If the lead aircraft diverted because of the cloud cover, many of the other aircraft, in order to clear the clouds, could not maintain a close order to the lead, ended up separating, and that's where the aircraft ended up dropping instead of on target, but either off target or on the wrong target. This map will give you a general idea not only of the invasion, but also of the airborne assault. If you notice here, the five lines in the middle of the screen represent the, air, the land ma mission coming in from the beach assault. The lines off to the left and coming around represent the airborne. This may be a little easier to see, but those five lines in the middle are what the beach assault would have looked like the distance separating each of those beaches was a little over 12 miles. So you had a very concentrated force coming into each of those five beaches. Each of those five beaches would then be receiving troops in variation in size. But if you can imagine planning roughly 150,000 troops on that beach starting at around 6.30 in the morning till about 5 p.m. on that first day. Where the arrow is pointing to on this map is the target for the, our aircraft. That's where troops were being dropped. I'll let you read this rather than my read it for you. But this gives you a general idea of what their mission was that day. This is a photo of Company G, part of the 3rd Battalion. Members of this group would have been carried in our aircraft. History over time has a tendency to be available and sometimes to disappear. I preface my remarks by saying we have photos of Company G. We were unable to acquire photos of Company H but we do have photos of Company I. Those three companies' personnel would have been carried in our aircraft in groups of 18 to 21. The aircraft may have flown as many as three, four missions that day, carrying in troops to the same targets. On some resupply missions, they may have only carried in supplies and no troops. But of the 44 aircraft accompanying ours in that mission, the other 44 were also carrying members from these three companies. In addition, the 325th in Airborne Engineers were also part of the wing. Just to give you an idea, some photos from that day. One of the things that people question, when you see the photo, you have to realize these are combat photographers who are taking pictures on that day. The only thing that they're shooting are cameras. They are not wearing anything to protect them. They may be in uniform, they may be wearing flak jackets, but more often than not, 
they are just as much a target as those in uniform. This is what the image would have looked like from the ground or from another plane looking at the airborne dropping in. The beach assault would have come off a landing craft, LSTs, any other small beach craft. Ships looking out to the harbor, it would have been covered from horizon to horizon. Famous, famous scenes of landing craft exiting and dropping off their troops. And at the end of the day, as the supply ships are coming in, and if you look carefully, you might be able to see what the mulberries look like on these pictures. Point de Hoc, famous hill along one of the beaches. Members of the Second Airborne Rangers had to climb this hill. 225 Rangers, the job was to climb the hill to neutralize the German shore batteries that were attacking naval ships in the water. Of the 225 that climbed the hill, by the end of the assault, 90 were still standing. These is is the casualty count for the day. U.S. Allied forces suffered a little over 10,000 casualties. U.S. forces a little over 4,000 deaths. Enemy forces for that day, 60,000 casualties, a little over 9,000 deaths. One thing to recognize, during any of the assaults, both by airborne as well as fighter and bomber attack, civilians in the region were unfortunately subject to the same assaults that the enemy were. It was estimated between 10 and 20,000 civilians were in fact casualties during the assault. The Normandy invasion was considered operationally successful when Paris was liberated in August. From the period June 6th through the end of August, this was still considered a D-Day operation. By the end of August, total casualty count was a little over 400,000, roughly 200,000 apiece. Both US, British, Canadian forces were suffered as well as by the enemy force. Casualty count, roughly 53,000 Allied forces died during the D-Day operation. Thanks so much for joining us on this commemoration of the 75th anniversary of D-Day. We hope you guys got to learn a little bit more about our planes in the museum as well. If you want to know what the next event is, don't forget to check out our website at lionairmuseum.org. I'm Marcus Gropel. Till we meet again, and blue skies to you.